Hello, and thanks everyone for joining uh, our webinar today with Presales Collective. Uh, Presales Collective is the largest global community for presales professionals. Um, so, today we have a really interesting topic. Before that, I'll introduce myself. My name is Gokul, and I head up a solution engineering team for a testing startup named Catalon. So, very nice to meet you all. And uh, Matthew, McKenna, and Pavel, very nice to meet you. Um, and really excited to have this conversation today with you all. So, I think uh, we should get started. I, I see a lot of people joining. So, we really have an exciting topic today um, around stories from the field, right? Um, today, we're going to talk about how the journey to pre-sales has been for uh, people from different folk, uh, different walks of life and, you know, coming from different careers. So that's kind of what we're going to talk about today. So really exciting. Uh, I myself have been... Uh, into pre-sales purely from software engineering, but that's kind of more traditional. I'd love to hear the stories of uh, Matthew, Pavel, and McKenna. So we'll get started. Um, I'm going to talk about um, the stories from the field from each of them, and then we'll wrap up with a Q&A. We'll also have a survey sent out uh, that you can answer at the end. Uh, we'll ha also have some summaries and announcements in the last five minutes. So Stay tuned for that. Um, thank you for Pre-Sales Collective to make this a global community and uh, you know continuously host events like this where everyone can learn from each other and share experiences. And that's uh, kind of what we are all here to do. Thank you to the audience for joining and spending your time with us today. So uh, just to get uh, a lot from the webinar today. I'd like to make this a really interactive session. So feel free to ask your questions using the Q&A function uh, and then be active on the chat, right? I think it's the, the most important thing to do is, you know, everybody comes from different experiences, not just the panelists here. Uh, so feel free to share your experience, how you've gone through to a pre-sales career. Um, it'd be really exciting for us to learn a lot of those stories uh, in the chat. So. Thank you again, and uh, we'll get started. Um, Matthew, um, you know, I, I guess I'd like you to kind of walk through um, what was the biggest theme in become uh, you becoming a solution consultant overall. Gokul, yes, thank you. The biggest theme, the way I decided to approach this is through three keys, which I saw throughout my journey. Let me wind back the clock a little bit. And for anyone joining, I'm Matthew. I'm now a solutions lead focusing in the financial sector. And you'll see where that plays in in just a little bit. When I started my career, I had never heard of this little corner we call solutions consulting. It's such a surprise that I ended up here. But here's how it happened. So when I talk about keys, each of these parts of my journey, I took away one pivotal thing, one key to leading to my success and to the place that I am today. And by the way, I love solutions consulting and I love what I do. So I started my career in investment banking. This was such a privilege for me. Also kind of didn't see that coming, but I did see coming that I would learn a lot. And I did. I learned a lot about how to deal with people. And I have summarized that as stakeholder skills here. What do I mean by that? I'm constantly dealing with people that I know people that I don't know with all kinds of requests. And you'll see that that comes around later on. I made the move into FinTech and this is where I picked up my technical skills. That's also gonna be a, an important key when it comes to solutions consulting. And I love being able to exercise my technical muscles. It's a great part of the world when you can find a problem and then identify what's behind it and use your technical skills to solve that problem. Mm, problem solving gets me going. So after I took out my stakeholder skills from investment banking and my technical skills from my first move into FinTech, I was presented with the opportunity to join the role that I have now. And that's solutions consulting to me, bringing really strong stakeholder skills to close a deal, solve problems along the way and bring it all together and shake hands at the end of the day. I've loved it. So the theme there 
is really taking away some strong skills from each of the parts of my career. Yeah, no, that's that's really good story, right? I think, um, Matthew, just quick question for you. Do you think that uh, subject matter expertise in the uh, industry that you're working on is important? Mm, of course it's important, but is it necessary to step in? I think that there's an important distinction there. In some industries, of course, it's going to be very, very important. But from what I've seen so far, we've had a lot of success in bringing in smart people with great skill sets and then upskilling them into the industry that we're in. Because guess what? We know the industry pretty well, and we know how to talk to it about people who are just coming in. And as part of being a solutions consultant, you need to be able to talk to people coming from all kinds of different knowledge levels. So I think that I would focus on skills first. And then industry knowledge can be gained along the way. Of course, our best solutions consultants are going to blend both of those things together. And when you say skills, Matthew, um, is there a you know top two or three things that come to mind? Ooh, I would love to talk about this. I have a couple of favorite solutions consulting skills. I would summarize them in communication skills because that's going to cover your demoing. That's going to cover your emailing and the ways that you're interacting with all kinds of stakeholders. So communication is massive. And then what I've called technical skills here, it goes one level deeper than that. It's really knowing your stuff, whatever you're talking about, being able to actually solve problems, knowing your stuff with your technical skills, with your product. I think blending those two things together, those are the key skills for me. I guess there are a couple of other questions I had for you, um, you know, know you're a solution lead at this point. Um, what was it like making the transition from an individual contributor to a leader? Yeah. So I've always been interested in leading people. I'm very happy to have had that responsibility now. And in the role that I play now, I'm actually a player coach. So I am still out there in the field with a couple of deals under my name, but more excited now to be handing out the best deals for my team to step up to. That's how I got the best learning experiences that led me to where I am. So now my big focus is making sure that I'm able to delegate those big deals out to my team and support them in the best ways so that they can walk a similar path to me. I am so thankful for the ways that I've been able to take risks and my companies have taken risks on me, put me in front of things to stretch me. And that is really exciting for me. So one more note on what was it like going from an IC to managing people, you have to think about not just being the star player anymore. That was a big lesson for me, actually. One thing that I haven't touched on yet is where the pre-sales collective helped me a lot. And I'm, I'm not being asked to say this, but one of the things I've taken away from everything that I've learned through the, being part of the pre-sales collective is what it means to not just be that star player, but also to manage and to let people shine in their own ways. That was a big learning for me, not just to go alongside them, but to give them the space to step up and learn in their own ways. That's great. Um, I guess uh, and I'm also curious in understanding McKenna's and uh, Pavel's idea of what are some of the core skills that are required for this role, McKenna? Yeah, I, I'll talk about this a bit in, in my part as well, but I think, um, I think Matthew hit the nail on the head when he said communication skills, right? Listening, um, asking questions, really digging in to find out what, what is the customer or prospect's real issue. They might be saying one thing, but what's the actual problem? And then how do we solve that? Great. Um, Bible, your thoughts? Yeah, I love that. I'll just piggyback on that a little bit, a little bit of a preview in terms of where my journey was a bit of a struggle. Uh, the skill that I've had to work on the most is when I first got into being a sales engineer, I was embarrassed by the title or the word sales in my title. Uh, yeah. So I think just mentally getting comfort with that and not just thinking I need to answer all the questions and be the most technical engineer out here. Um, that was what for me, at least was table stakes. You know, other folks might be more comfortable with it, but if you're not, you got to get over that hurdle pretty quickly. Fantastic. Uh, one last question for you, Matthew. Um, how do you think uh, about um, managing a team of three? Like, is that new responsibility? Is it adding a lot of, uh, uh, you know, added responsibilities to your current, your previous role? Um, how, how do you feel about that in general, like as a new manager? 
one of my top skills is positivity and enthusiasm. And I have to mention that because what I'm going to say next is probably something I would say to any kind of team that I'm managing. But with my team of three, I think this is the perfect size of a team. I would not change it in a second because what I can do with our team of three, and this is again, some, an idea that I got from Free Sales Collective, run this like its own business. So what do I mean by that? We actually sat down, me and my two team members, and we gave ourselves little heads of our business titles. We said, okay, who's gonna be the CXO? Who's gonna be the CYO? And we gave ourselves these little titles and we were splitting up this responsibility to elevate all of us because yeah. any leader, yes, you're leading the charge, you're setting the vision, but you're not gonna succeed alone. And mm -hmm. I want my team members to be able to step up into that. And when you are a small team like that, it's so easy to give everyone responsibility because you can see everyone has spaces to step up and no one is gonna get forgotten about. And also no one can hide. It's time for everyone to kind of step it up that way. So that's what I have to say about managing a small team. I'm very excited about that. Catch me again in a couple of years when I have a team of 10, I'll probably say, oh, the team of 10 is the perfect size. But yeah. for now, I love the opportunity to work so closely with people and really elevate them with that responsibility. That's, that's really great to understand. I think. Um that's that's how every leader should think about their team right i think it's um, you know you you win together you lose together and you know you succeed in your careers together so i think it's uh, it's all really good points um over to mckenna right I, I just wanted to understand your kind of journey i know it's kind of unique right from sales to pre-sales um love to get your idea of why you made that move um and what's really benefited you? Absolutely. Yeah, it is It is funny. It's kind of uncommon. Often you might hear about someone pre-sales actually moving into sales. Um, but my journey was a little different from sales to pre-sales. Um, we were just discussing before we hopped into the live session, you know, that journey. And I was saying it's the best career move I've ever made. And you'll hear that a lot um, from pre-sales folks. But a little bit of background. I was an account executive for seven years and I loved it. Um, I loved being customer facing. I loved the travel. I loved the competition. I, I, I love working with our customers. So I knew that that was something I wanted to continue no matter what I did next. Um, but why I wanted to leave sales, I just wasn't feeling challenged in the way I wanted to be challenged. And I knew if I looked toward a more um, technical role that I would find that challenge that I was seeking. But moving actually into, into pre-sales or into a solution engineering role um, was more difficult than if I moved up the sales ladder, right? So it was definitely a, an interesting choice and a journey that I decided to embark on. Um, so, I was, yeah, go ahead. No, I, I just had a question there, right? Like, I think uh, you've been on both sides. Mm -hmm. um, what do you, uh, can, this can lead to a different topic of discussion, which can sure. go for hours, right? But uh, I, I do want to ask that here to at least spark this conversation. Um, what do you think is like the key difference that you see between these two roles and how, uh, how much control do you have over your deals now versus when you were an account executive? Do you feel yeah. that control anxiety? Yeah, two great questions. Um, I find I have maybe a little less control over the deal. And as, as Matthew said too, you know, I'm not the star player anymore. I'm part of the team. Um, but the key difference I would say is that I become much more of a consultant. I'm able to say, maybe we aren't the right fit here. Yeah. Maybe we need to think about this differently. And as an account executive, you're you're very focused on quota. You don't you don't really have the ability to do that as much as um, you know a solution consultant or solution engineer does. And uh, what's your account executive's reaction to that? I guess uh, when you say it's not a good fit or it's uh, it's probably not the right time for this customer. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a delicate conversation. You don't just want to shut them down, but you want to explain why this might not be a fit and maybe how a different product could be, or maybe it's going to be a smaller deal, but it could in the future turn into something bigger. Um, I also say to them, you know, 
and this is a classic sales mantra, win fast, lose fast. If it's not the right fit, why would we try to make it a fit? I mean, obviously we want it to be a fit. We want to get the business. I, I'm compensated on, on, you know, winning business too. Um, but Hey, if we, if we need to let go of one deal to be able to focus on something else, it's worth it. Great. That's a uh, really impactful. Um, what are some of the favorite parts of you being a solution engineer? Yeah, I mean, one of the key things I love is the diversity in my day. Every call is different. Each customer or prospect is different, even though I'm working with primarily law firms. Um, each account executive is different. And it, it's really fun to work with people all over the business, too. That's something that I really enjoy. As a solution engineer, I'm able to work with proposals and solution architects and um, engagement managers. And, you know, depending on what you call them at your company, they might be different. But people throughout the business all working to get these deals done. Um, I also really love mentoring new solution engineers that join the team, which is which is a huge benefit, and also participating in the mentorship program. So you'll see here what I was able to do um, is when I was considering moving to solution engineering, we have a DocuSign solution engineering mentorship program. It's 12 weeks. And so I went through that program while doing my account executive role. Um, which really helped me test it out. You know, it's very rare to be able to test out a new role before you actually start it. So I was doing demos and doing discovery and um, always had someone there with me to kind of hold my hand if I needed the help. And um, that was that was hugely beneficial in my move, but now I'm able to mentor. So I just finished mentoring my first mentee through the program. Um, so that's something I love as well. That is awesome. So speaking about skills, right? Um, is there anything beyond the communication skills that were reiterated that do you believe that is required for the solution engineer role? Yeah, I mean, I think I've said this before, but those those soft skills, the listening well, the asking questions, having curiosity, um, I, I really, the storytelling skills, right? Being able to tie something that you're highlighting in a demonstration to actually something that another customer went through and solved, so, you know, telling a story about how they solved a problem. Those are the skills that I think are most important to have. You can learn the technical skills. You can learn the product knowledge. Um, I will say I benefited greatly from the industry knowledge. So I, I've worked with law firms for almost 10 years now. Uh, mm. When I transitioned from account executive to solution engineer, I was supporting the legal vertical still. So still on the vertical that I sold on, which did help me ramp up very quickly because I knew the industry. I knew the use cases. Um, I knew the buyers. So if that was a benefit. You don't need it, but that certainly helped me feel more confident from day one of being a solution engineer versus, um, you know, being really nervous. If I was working in financial services or something, that would take more time. That's great. Um, I guess there's a lot of AEs out there probably looking to make a similar move. Um, so how did you approach that conversation? Uh, what was most impactful when you made that conversation, uh, 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 when you moved to the new role of, of an SE? Yeah, I think um, one of the key pieces was watching my solution engineers when I was an AE and seeing what they did and, you know, having those conversations with them. What is your favorite part of the job? What, what are some challenges? Really understanding. I think it's hard to understand what goes on in a different role when you're not living it. So um, trying to have those different conversations to understand if it was the right fit for me. Um, and then once I moved over, the support of, I mean, at, at DocuSign, the solution engineering team is incredibly supportive. So uh, we have something called the WISE ERG, or Women in Solution Excellence Employee Resource Group, full of incredible women in solutions. Um, and they were all really supportive. Uh, my my first and current SE manager was incredibly supportive and shared with me the impact that I was making from day one, which, you know, imposter syndrome does creep in, especially when you make a move from a less technical role to a more technical role. And so to hear, you know, you're making a huge impact and here's why that gave me all the confidence that I needed. That's fantastic. I think, yeah, that imposter syndrome is really important to note, um, you know, uh, you can always think that you, you may not be able to do something, but just being able to get the confidence from the broader team is really important. Absolutely. Um, it's uh, so thank you, McKenna, for uh, for your story, and it's it's a really powerful story, and I'm sure a lot of people learn from that. Thank um, you. So cool. Transitioning over to Pavel, 
Uh, I just wanted to get your thoughts, Pavel, on um, maybe you start with your quick introduction and then we we'll go to your um, go to your story. Yeah, I'm I'm a little bit of the clown car, I think, coming here because I wasn't nearly as thoughtful uh, <laughs> when I got into pre-sales candidly. And it's actually kind of ironic. Shout out to Kevin and the team who grandfathered me in. I'm not a solutions consultant at the moment. In July, I made a transition uh, to our productivity team, which you can see here. Uh, so yeah, I'd love to kind of walk folks through it. I, as I put it together, um, it's kind of a fun, interesting exercise. I'd encourage everyone to do it. Um, I just draw themes, like what were each of the steps and kind of what do I remember and what was kind of the biggest thing happening. And candidly for me, I got into pre-sales on accident. Um, I had spent many, many years of my career all in post-sales roles, uh, working my way up from an individual contributor, you know, to people leadership, all of that. Um, and candidly just landed at a point where I was kind of miserable, but didn't want to admit that to myself and had to have multiple, literally multiple mentors independent of themselves be like, you don't seem happy with what you're doing. You should really look at this other role. And I just had not had great experiences in working with some of the sales partners. So I just avoided it as the plague and then eventually got to the point where it was like, okay, um, I just need to be honest with myself and make a change. Uh, so for me, to Matthew's point, it was helpful that I had a background in security because then where I got my first uh, opportunity in pre-sales was at another security company at CA, um, which was awesome. Uh, shout out to John O'Brien who hired me and took a massive bet. And uh, I'll always, always be grateful for him because what I found in 12 months was that was the question I asked myself all the time. Like, can I actually do this? Because I just could not sell software. And what I eventually would come to realize was I was embarrassed by the fact that I was supposed to sell software, right? Sales was in my title, but I didn't want to acknowledge it. I wanted to answer every question, never have a a moment and just wanted to be the smartest guy in the room, right? And what I quickly found out is that's not effective and that's not what I was getting paid for. So candidly, I got super lucky in this scenario and, and maybe a lot of us have that experience where I had someone else that I'd worked with before in professional services was at a company called Fuse. I was like, hey, we need pre-sales folks in the city that you're in. We can't find anyone. We think we can take a bet on you kind of thing, right? I was like, all right, let's do it. Why not? And it was a different domain to Matthew's point, uh, but having some experience doing pre-sales and at least some familiarity with how to give demos and navigate a sales cycle was helpful there. And the big lesson I took from there was if I really invest in how to sell, learn my sales process. At the time, it was MedPick for forecasting. So really learn what that was about. Participate in QBRs, be involved in forecast calls. If I actually did focus on those skills, I could get demonstrably better at my job. And that's what started, for me, at least the light kind of going off and was able to progress and, and do some decent things there. Um, so then a nice lesson in check your ego. I was like, all right, cool. I got this. I'm good. Let me take the next jump. I'm going to do a startup, help build a pre-sales team. It's going to be great. And I quickly learned a lesson for myself that what I'm selling and who I'm selling to matters. Yeah. And what I mean by that is, am I passionate about the problems I'm solving? Because for me, I want to get passionate about the product I'm selling and be the technical individual and like tell you all the things. And if I don't actually care about the problem I'm solving, that comes out. And if I don't understand or really get energized by the audience I'm speaking to, that shows up as well. Um, took me a little longer to kind of realize I was at that place uh, than I'd like to admit, but then, you know, kind of was right to make a change and kind of figure something else out. And it's how I got to where I'm currently at at Sprinkler. Um, again, this is another example, though, when you make a domain switch, you kind of have to work your way up again. Um, so it's a massive domain switch, but I was energized by the problem, challenged by the audience to McKenna's point. I got to sell to marketers and to the business. Like I've only sell, sold to IT and CIOs and things like that. Um, and it's incredibly challenging. It's super hard, uh, but really, really fulfilling. Um, unlike Matthew, though, I don't really want to go back into people leadership. I just feel like for me, I'm trying to be self-aware enough to realize I can do 80% of that job, but kind of that other 20% is really important. And you're, you're shorting your team if you don't really want to. Um, so I've been trying to candidly navigate a path of what can I do as an individual contributor? So, right, being a, a solution consultant, uh, we specialized in verticals of our platform. So I did that at a global level. Now I'm in productivity, trying to have impact there. So 
I'm currently in a state of like, I don't know what I want to be when I grow up and that I see path isn't super, super clear. Uh, but that's kind of where I sit now at, in, uh, in this leg of the journey. Great. Um, I think um, that's a really um, powerful story. It talks about many things, right? It talks about your uh, expertise in a certain domain and having to shift careers into more of a customer facing sales engineer and then moving in uh, in three roles in, in the same journey and then having to talk to different types of customers in different roles mm -hmm. um and and then you know deciding that the se leadership role is probably not for you at this point in your career and then being able to you know just uh, say you know what can I do better from an individual contributor standpoint? So that's a really powerful story for anyone who's thinking about their career. Um, so uh, thank you for that and really appreciate it. I have a couple of questions for you, Pavel. And, uh, you know, what are some of the relationships uh, that you have had that helped you in your overall journey? So is networking important for, uh, for a journey like this? Yeah, <laughs> for sure. So I think the first one, um, I I didn't make this up. I think I saw it as a tweet, but it was basically like, we're all customer service agents, right? The only thing that changes is what we type. And I I take that to mean like my first job is to go make my leader look good. They're taking a bet on me, investing in me. Let me make them look good, help them meet their objectives. I'll meet all my own. So it sounds kind of obvious, but those relationships are crucial. And as you start to do that, uh, you build your own credibility, not just with them, but then kind of with your entire uh, leadership chain, for sure. Um, the one that I stumbled into completely by accident, and this was just from being fortunate to work with really good sales leaders, was that, right? Working your way up through your sales leadership in your organization and being super credible with them is super, super important and is really impactful. At least for me, it has been in my career. Um, I had one at my time at Fuse that was kind of had that, you know, real kind of hard talk, like, you want to be good at this or not? And I'm, well, of course, you know, he triggered that little competitive itch. And it's like, well, yeah, he's like, well, you're not going to be into and then we just had the chat. And what he impressed upon me that day was treat yourself, your career, what you're doing as a deal. Who, yeah. who are your champions? What are the problems you're solving? What are your unique capabilities, right? Like, you want to go charge a premium for yourself, right? You have to be solving a big time problem. And a light went off there that really helped to then realize my champion can't just be my boss. My champion can't just be my AEs. It's got to be leadership in those chains. It can be the team in marketing. It can be the engineering folks, product managers, right? Like I have to build champions everywhere in an org uh, to support the efforts that I want to have. And I think that was something that, and again, a light went off. It's like, oh, that's why I love this job. Because like McKenna mentioned, it's the greatest career move I've ever made. I think it's the greatest job in a tech company, but I didn't realize it's because for me anyway, it's you sit in the middle of all these relationships and all these problems and you're in a super unique and let's be real valuable for ourselves place and that you've got a superpower that you can communicate, you're technical, you can solve problems and then everyone's going to want a piece of you. So super long answer, go cool, sorry, but no, no, um, the relationships think, piece is one that has, has been an accident for me, but one that I'm super glad to have stumbled into for sure. Yeah, it's a really powerful story. Thank you for sharing, Pavel. I think um, just one last question for you is, what do you think has worked well for you in your eight-year pre-sales journey and what is not? I can tell you what's not first. That one's really obvious. Um for us to get in these roles, you start selling deals. Like, let's be real. Like, it's a very unique set of skills. So everyone on this call, everyone in this job, you've got a superpower that's like super valuable. You like competition, right? You can communicate. It also, though, comes with a bit of an ego. And that ego can really hold you back. And the way it always comes out for me is every time I think I'm good, I got it. Yeah. I coast. And I think I'm coasting, but I 100% am getting worse and being less effective. And every time I've made a change, it's not been as thoughtful as McKenna had shared, right? 
um, it's, it's been kind of a, I look up and it's like, I'm not happy. I'm not productive. I'm not selling anything. I'm not, a, whatever it might be. And it's kind of like, oh, right. Cause I just thought I had it and I was good. And I think for me, it's take on that extra project, try and get 2% better at whatever, like just constantly be pushing yourself uh, because every time I haven't, that's, that's not worked out well ever. Um, yeah. I think honestly, just the treat yourself as a deal that's been the thing that's helped me the most. It's helped me learn how to build champions, how to get through some of the tougher relationships and to be more comfortable and confident to make moves and then, you know, ask to be compensated for the value I can deliver, right? Yeah. And to be fair, I think that everybody um, loses sight of um, what they're doing after uh, repeating certain things for a certain period of time. Uh, but the word coasting is a really important word that you mentioned. Uh, for everybody on the call, if you are in a point where you feel like you're coasting, you feel like you're doing the same thing again, start exploring, right? I think there's a lot more options, there's a lot more career opportunities. And uh, just start exploring and look at things uh, in a different way. Um, and that, as, as yeah. Pavel said, it, it can also be taking on a new project or becoming a subject matter expert in a new product that we're launching. Um, I, I did that at DocuSign and that keeps things fresh as well. Um, so it might not be a full on career change, but you know, continuing to be involved in something new and with new people too, to your point of you know working with people across the business, it also keeps that fresh. Yeah. So thank you, Pebel. Thank you, McKenna. And thank you, Matthew, for sharing all of your perspectives today. Um, I just wanted to start off with a few questions for the audience. Uh, feel free to jump in uh, for all the panelists here. What kind of things do you do you prepare, do you do to prepare for getting into pre-sales? Is it books or videos or podcasts or things like that that you would learn, like go and learn from? Uh, in order to make a transition to pre-sales. Um, any thoughts from the audience would be really appreciated. And then um, and then feel free to jump in, uh, Pavel, McKenna, and Matthew. I think the most important thing, if you're starting this journey, is to take stock of yourself and know what are you really good at right now? And then what are those areas you could upskill in? Because honestly, those two things I think are so important. Every pre-sales person has their own brand. They've got their own specialty. I'm not the same as the two members of my team. I'm not the same as Pavel and McKenna. We all have our specialties. So knowing that, knowing your silver bullet and get really, really good at that, focus on that as well. And then of course, if you see there are gaps that you need, bring those up to the level that you know the organization is going to expect of you. Yeah, Absolutely. that's a great point. McKenna, your thoughts? I, uh, I focused on, you know, up leveling my technical skills because I was coming from a sales role and we had some really good um, certi certifications within DocuSign that, that I was able to do. You would typically do that when you were hired on as a solution engineer. I went through them before the interview. So really trying to up level my skills with, um, with some certifications and kind of trainings internally about the product. But again, that was my gap, right? Um, yeah. So exactly to Matthew's point. Yeah, just filling and, your gaps and identifying your pain points and trying to solve that early, right? Yep. Yeah, and I think I came from it, the, the other side. My gaps were the opposite in where I had a some technical background, which I found has been table stakes is commonly the, the thought. But um, in my opinion, I think the soft skills and the selling and the presenting are starting to become table stakes as well, whether you're in a PLG org or in a traditional kind of full long enterprise sales cycle org. Um, so I did kind of like bootstrap type stuff. I found this medium article in the greatest sales deck ever. And it was from it was Zora. I think if folks are familiar with it, it's from like 2016 or whatever, mm -hmm. you can get it online, just Google it, the PDFs out there. And it like got, went through this visual style and then approach to how to sell with a PowerPoint. So I challenged myself to build them that way. And then I saw this kind of, I think it was like a random TED talk or something where this, this person just had a whole presentation of pictures behind him going, no clicker, mm -hmm. and then was giving the talk that way. And what he said was like, oh, well, at the end, I guess he was talking about well, the way it was, is I know what I'm going to say when I've practiced this, I've prepared, 
And if I can't capture your attention with what I'm saying and only use these for prompts, then I'm not telling a very good story. Mm -hmm. And it was super awkward. My wife was not very happy with getting this presentation over and over and over and over (laughs) and over from me. But that was the way I tried to get better. Like, okay, if I'm going to actually do this, I've got to be better than just Mr. Click around and and answer technical questions. I got to say, I love the ways that they, you can optimize everything that we're doing. We can always do a little bit better because it's very easy to throw some slides up and then talk to the slides. I love that idea of like going beyond that, asking some questions of like, what can we actually do to communicate to our audience? Because we're trying to communicate. We're not trying to show off a slideshow. And engage them, not just communicate, but engage them and get them talking back to us, right? That is where you really discover what, what their true issues are and how we can help. We're all dreaming of those gong calls where it's like, our company is like 15%, they're yeah. 85%. Mm. <laughs> yeah. There's nothing worse than when they're one um, percent and uh, they haven't asked you one thing throughout the whole demonstration or conversation. Um, I guess we have a question from the audience. How would you transition from a BA role into a solution consulting role? Uh, and again, BAs are generally functional experts, but not uh, probably aware of the communication aspects. So my thought here is. Um, like the panelists mentioned earlier, focus on the communication aspects, focus on discovery, focus on being able to go deeper with customers and identifying the common questions that you would ask. Um, and then build a build a skill for yourself and right and, and then practice. I think those are all the things that I would say um, you know, completely works in your favor in making the transition. I would also say network, right? Talk to solution engineers or sales engineers, whatever they're called at your organization. Um, They're so open to conversations. Put a meeting on a new solution engineer or pre-sales person's calendar each week and learn from them too. Um, But it's a great way to find out, you know, what they would recommend to kind of up-level your skills. Yeah, plus 1,000 on that because (laughs) I feel like almost all of us stumbled into the job most of the time, not stumbled, but like didn't know it existed, I should say. So anytime someone reaches out internally and even externally, like, Hey, I'm interested. I'm thinking like the thing you want to do the most is pay it forward and like help someone get into it faster than maybe you may or may not have. So get on calendars, talk to them for sure. And, and, And I'm thinking as a BA, like the superpower I would want to take from you is the ability to take something complex and make it simple to lean into that. So you have that ability. Now, how do you layer on technology and how do you make a demo even easier? How do you uh, tie it to their problems to Gokul's point, right? Do your discovery, figure out what their problems are. You have to somehow connect it to your solution. That's the job. Well, you've got the secret sauce there. So go focus on those two areas there and put it together. I got goosebumps when you said, take something complex and communicate Mm -hmm. it simply. I've been in calls with people like a CTO who doesn't even know what an API is. So you have these expectations and sometimes you got to be moving on the fly to communicate to the level that you need to with the person you're talking to. Correct. Uh, What are some of the challenges um, that you have encountered in making the transition into into pre-sales? Or um, the first uh, key uh, problem or the mistake that you made in your first year of being in presets. Pablo mentioned something earlier, which brought a memory back for me. And it was the first time that I ran into a question that I didn't know the answer to. Now that in itself is not too big of a problem, but here's where I made a mistake. This was the challenge that I then had to develop over the next six months. I took what the customer was saying at face value. I said, They said, hey, do you have this piece of functionality? Do you support this? And I said, no, we don't. And I had a knowledge gap there, but I just, I left it there. I didn't ask questions like, why is that important to you? Because if you go down that route, you can start to see, is there something else that our product does, which meets that in an even better way? And that is the kind of thing that I have seen because sometimes if we haven't built this piece of functionality, it's because that's not the best way to do it. You got to have a little bit of belief in your product and a really, really deep level of curiosity. And like, don't let yourself get shaken. Believe that you can understand more about what they're doing and then help them see the best solution. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Any other thought from 
Babel and McKenna? I hypothetically, if you got onto a team and just got and became a grumpy little elf with your sales partner when they didn't do what you said you <laughs> what you thought that they should do, just hypothetically, uh, don't do that. And I'm trying, I'm being a little silly about it, but honestly, it's a thing, right? Whether it's ego, you're working fast, you're covering six reps, it's just you, you're st- whatever it might be, like you're going to run into these situations where you think this is how to do the job. And unless you're like McKenna and have carried the bag, you don't know what that's like. Um, our job is incredibly hard, but our counterparts earn every dollar, pound, euro, whatever that they get. Mm-hmm. So just work with your folks. It doesn't mean it's always pleasant. You know, there's going to be friction and challenges all the time to make each other better or to resolve conflict. But don't lead in with, I've got all the answers and just listen to me. We'd sell more. If you really think that, go grab a bag. Um, I did not operate that way when I first got in and and had to get course corrected pretty firmly on that. So, yeah. It's a great call out, Pavel. And also it it goes so far when you're building those relationships with your account executives or whatever they're called, your organization, you really have to have a trusting relationship to have an effective partnership. Um, I mean, there was one point, and I know that I benefited from coming from the sales work, but there was one point where I was managing the entire vertical as the sole solution engineer. So it was 21 people. And uh, because I had built those relationships with all of the account executives, they were really understanding of, you know, where can you pull me in? Where can you spend more time? Um, listen, you've, you've taught me this. You ran an enablement, so I don't need you on this certain call, right? Um, building those relationships is huge. And I think that's a great call out that we haven't discussed today. Great. Thank you all for um, your valuable opinions and going through your journey. Um, And everybody's journey is different. Um, All I say is, if you want to get into this profession, um, just take a lot of the feedback that was given today, right? I think that that'll really help in in making your transition work. So um, thank you again for taking the time. Um, just wanted to open a poll here on how we did today. Um, Kevin will open the poll here from Precess Collective. You should see it here. Um, and uh, we'll go from there. So give it a minute. Now, while we're doing that, we'll wrap this up. Uh, thank you, Reprise, for, um, for really sponsoring us um, and in making this event happen, making a webinar like this happen. And, uh, you know, we really um, thank you so much for sponsoring uh, this event overall. Uh, Reprise is a software that helps companies change the way um, they sell software and essentially give you um, an an ability to be, um, you know, really effective in your sales engineer roles. Thank you to um, the state of pre-sales report from Vivin as well. And thank you for Vivin to be a sponsor as well. Uh, we will have a another session pretty soon on the November 15th, hosted by Rishi. Uh, it'll be talking about, you know, it takes a village to close a deal. So how uh, effective uh, you need to be in order to close more deals. It's kind of the whole topic. And I think that'll be a really interesting one just to collaborate with different teams and being able to connect with different teams um, and try to get everyone on the same page in order to close a big deal, right? So that is uh, going to be an interesting topic for sure. And so thank you again for joining us and really exciting topic today and uh, look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you.